Hi, I'm Gary Nall. I'd like to welcome you to our continuation of our ongoing series, Classroom on the Air. Now, the classroom on the air means that we're taking a topic. It might be depression or anxiety. It might be the crisis in our life. It, how about how many times you've gotten angry and you wish you hadn't because there was some negative outcome? So we deal with that. In fact, I dealt with a topic on that called Anger Taming the Beast Within. How about you have so many good qualities, qualities people appreciate about you, and it's part of your living legacy. But unfortunately, with all that you have going on that is positive, you have hidden or denied to deal with your dark side. Now, we all have conditioning in our life from childhood on that was both positive, hopefully that's the dominant one, and negative. Hopefully we don't have a lot of that. But throughout life, the more chances we take, the more risk we take, the more problems we're going to have because nothing goes as smoothly as we want it to. There's no ideal out there. There's no perfection out there. What we have is works in progress, and that's fine. We go through transitions, and that's expected. Sometimes we stay too long where we shouldn't, and we don't stay long enough when we should. There are opportunities we should have said no to, and our intuition told us, don't do that. Yet we went ahead and did it with negative consequences sooner or later. And then there are opportunities we said no to because we weren't ready. We didn't have the confidence or courage. We were still dealing with insecurity. Where does all this stuff come from? Well, it comes from our conditioning. And if we're really conscious, we can overcome an awful lot of it. And therefore deal with our dark side, making the dark side less so, and making the bright side more so. And hence, overcoming the dark side, happiness, um, all of these wonderful over 90 different self-empowerment themes in our class on the air, just on our emotions alone, and our values and beliefs. But then we do ones on gardening and cooking and uh, many other topics, all with a solution in mind. Today, we're going to do something a little, consider a little esoteric, but very important. It's a study that comes from Queensland in Australia and the university, and, and it deals with the zone. Now, today, athletes in particular talk about being in the zone where you just don't know what you're doing, but you, whatever you're doing, you're doing it really well. And there was a very famous baseball pitcher, Roger Clements. He had multiple Cy Young Awards, best pitcher. And he said once that he knew he was going to have as good a game as was possible because he was in the zone. Meaning when he looked at the batter in the baseball game, he knew that there's a strikeout box. And behind the batter is a referee, an umpire. That umpire is going to say strike or ball. And he got an enormous percentage of his uh, pitches into the strike zone. When asked, what were you thinking? He said, I wasn't thinking. I didn't hear the crowds. I didn't hear anything. It was like a, there was a silence in me. Years ago, we're talking about the mid-1970s, I was visited one Sunday in Central Park where I would meet every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning at 5th Avenue and 90th Street. And there'd be people showing up learning how to run or walk, and even those who would like to become faster or better athletes. So we had a full spectrum of people there. But all of them wanted to improve. And so we had, it was free. And over the years, and we're still doing it, by the way, since 1975 till today, that's a long time. It's almost 50 years. We have helped tens of thousands of individuals finish marathons. In fact, we used to travel around the world doing the first marathon, the first London marathon. And there were about 70 of us who went over to uh, England to do it. We stayed in a hotel on the park instead of one of the uh, visitors' hotels for the back. And it cost a little bit more money. And if anyone couldn't pull up their share, we just chipped into a, a blind spot. So a pot, so we uh, everybody was in the hotel. So we would roll out in the morning. We'd go, go do our stretching. Then we would, in silence, we would run around Hyde Park, which is quite simply a magnificent park. Upkept, there's no damage. There's people respect it. And, uh, and there was a movie that would come out called Chariots of Fire. Did any of you see it? Wonderful movie, very inspirational. 
touched your heart and stimulates you in a good way, why can't I do better? And you can. But it talked about excellence. There was a Scottish runner who was quite simply the greatest runner on the planet in the distances he went. And then there was several other outstanding athletes, and they were all going towards the Olympics, 1924 Olympics. And uh, it showed them in college, this one group that represented Great Britain and Ireland and Scotland. And this guy says, uh, God made me to run. And I'm honoring that by running and I can run fast. In fact, true story, he was in the race that would determine who would go to the Olympics, and he tripped, fell down. Now, mind you, he was with the best athletes in Scotland. He got back up, ran to catch the back of the pack, and beat all of them at the finish line. Well, watching that was an English athlete who had become a legend. That was he, it was he who that movie was based upon. And uh, he got a coach who coached him, and indeed he won in the Olympics. And it was a story about moral courage, because it was Jewish and there was lots of anti-Semitism, spoken or unspoken, at his university. And it was all about, can this person from the outside of our culture, it's all about culture, can this person outside of our culture deserve a place in it, even though he is... Jewish. Well, hypocrites they were. The most famous prime minister outside of Winston Churchill was the Israeli, uh, Queen Victoria's favorite. Uh, he was, in fact, he had ordered hay to be put down on the street in front of Queen Victoria's uh, palace so that when carriages went down, they wouldn't make as much noise because she was sick. There's a lot of contradictions in all stories. In any case, uh, the person, when we did the first uh, London Marathon, and we didn't do it to race it, we did it for fun. The races that we did, we did the marathons to win, if we could, or just improve over the last marathon, then we just sum up, we just did it as a party to, to enjoy life. And it was just glorious. Imagine 70 people running together in the park, all in great shape. Some had become elite athletes. And then there's this meeting and the last survivor of the 24 Olympics from Great Britain was there, an older gentleman. Now, by today's standards, if he lived, a, he didn't smoke and didn't drink, and et cetera, he would have been looking and acting much younger. But it turned out he died shortly thereafter. And we couldn't hear what he was saying. But uh, from the other athletes who were there, thousands together, who were closer to him, it was about believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, who else is going to want to believe in yourself and you? And so we took everything very literally at that time. So we did the marathon, and the, the marathon course ran through some of those beautiful parts of the uh, England, London, and it was wonderful. And we got to see the countryside and how nice the British farmers and people were. And But I also, we would go on to do many other, the first, first Montreal, first Waterfront Marathon, Jersey Shore Marathon, Long Island Marathon, the Marine Corps Marathon, the Jamaica Marathon, where I won a gold medal in my competition. Uh, the Los Angeles, uh, I was got a medal in the race walking. San Francisco Marathon. So we did about 50 of the first marathons. Now, why is that important? Because almost none of these people on their own would have done it. These people just wanted to get in a little better shape. Someone might come, for example, um, uh, a person might weigh 220 pounds. Their normal weight was 150. So they were coming to lose weight. And then a year later, they're in a marathon. And they're they're having a ball. And then when they finished around every single finisher in all these marathons, they give you a medal. It's not the gold, silver, or bronze. Those for the lead athletes. But they give you a medal. And they wrap you in an aluminum cloth. And you feel great. But that once you do that, then we have this conversation. When you started off, we did a simple exercise. It's hard to imagine running 26 miles, 26 plus miles to do a marathon when you have a trouble walking two blocks without being winded. So we're going to do it in a linear way. Each time we work out, see if you can add just 100 yards. That's all. 
100 yards, 300 feet, onto the distance. And then in time, see if you can make that time a little faster. So it was very slow. It would take seven to 10 months before they finally were in shape to do the marathon. And so our goal was do the marathon like it's a party, not a race. Celebrate what you've achieved. Think of your pulse rate is lower, which is good. Your heartbeat is stronger, which is good. Your blood pressure is perfect. Your blood sugar is good. Your body fat index is down. You can see, you can see your abs. Your muscles are strong. All right, you're at the height of your health. Celebrate that. Okay, that was the message. Then I said this: Who would like to become an elite athlete? And about a hundred individuals over a period of about five years, said, yeah, well, we train differently. We train based upon deeper introspection and meditation. Control your breathing. Focus upon relaxing, no stress. And every one of those people, famous people, worldwide legends, Sam Skinner, Sid Howard, Thelma Wilson, um, uh, Queenie Thompson, uh, we had Joan Rowland. We had a whole bunch of people who were the best, no matter where we competed. Every race we did in America, one of us won. Sometimes many of us won. Uh, Louise Nottage was the best of all. She was quite simply the greatest senior athlete in American history. She started just as a normal person. So you have to desire to be better than you are to be elite at anything. And I'm not saying elite as far as simply better than everyone, you know, for your ego. I'm saying pushing yourself to another level of consciousness. And when you can do that, everything else in your life is seen differently. Get up in the morning, you want to make your bed and you want to make it nice because everything else you do that day is going to be about everything I did this morning, I'm going to do with my work, with my relationships, Maintain balance, not too serious, not too frivolous, happy times, sharing times, don't be a burden upon others, do what you can, be more self-sufficient, learn, grow, simple things. Now that gets us to the zone, because around this time, one day in the park, this fellow shows up and he comes over to me and I would take questions for an hour after our morning lecture, we do a lecture, then go into the park, because it wasn't just about getting our body in shape. It was about reconditioning our mind, not to have the limits that most people had because other people in their life couldn't do something. So they didn't want them even trying. So building self-confidence, self-love, self-awareness, discipline. This guy comes over, he says, um, I'm Dr. Asa, that's A-S-A, -A, and I'm one of the two leading exercise physiologist in Israel. And I wanted to come here because you're way ahead of us in doing the marathons. And I heard that you had a club that did everything differently. That's why you call yourself the natural living. And what's this natural living about? So we had a whole conversation. And he said, well, I have a cardiovascular stress test tenor, and I'd like to test some of your athletes. So in a week, we took five of us down. And he said, well, we're going to put you on the treadmill. We hooked up all the equipment. He said, and we're going to start you to flat elevation and take you clear up to the steepest elevation. And one of the athletes at the time said, well, how long are we supposed to be on there? He said, well, most athletes are good to go for about 12 to 15 minutes. Only a few can go for 20 minutes because we're going to get you at the fastest speed and the highest elevation. And that's really hard. And you're not allowed to hold the rails. When you can no longer keep running up a hill uh, fast, then you nod your head, we'll bring it immediately right back down, then you can grab the rails and we'll see how well you did. And so I asked the five athletes, I got them together and I said, look, use what you were taught, go into the zone. Because when you're in the zone, you're liberating your cells, they're no longer limited. And they knew exactly what that meant because we'd have multiple lectures on it and demonstrations on it. What happens when you're ooh, going to do a race, ooh, going to do a study in college, pass a test, I'm nervous. Suddenly everything constricts. Fear, anxiety constricts. You suddenly pump up adrenaline, norepinephrine, catecholamines, 
And worst of all, you start pumping up the one, the one flight or fight chemical, cortisol, that can cause heart attacks and strokes. It can also dysregulate the rhythm and electrical charging to your heart, causing a regular heartbeat. But just the opposite happens when you do deep meditations where you control your breathing deep and exhale, slow and get it all out, a little stronger at the end. And that's what we had trained doing. We also had run up Heartbreak Hill. That's, if you're not from New York, at the end of Central Park, which is six miles around, there's a hill. It's called Heartbreak Hill because it goes way up, on a really steep elevation, and then down again, then up. And it's not a flat course. So we would just sometimes run 20 miles around the top. There, there's a, a cutaway. So you can just run around the hill, cross the uh, transverse, and then run the hill again, transverse. And then we would do the Versa Climber, that machine that you push and pull simultaneously at the highest resistance. Then we'd run up our steps in my building, 25 flights of stairs, 25 times. And then when they could do that after three weeks, we then had them hold a jug of water in each hand, nine pounds as a gallon. That's 18 pounds they're carrying up the steps until they could do that 25 times. It felt like your lungs were on fire. felt like you couldn't breathe. I said, now, what's going to happen when you get into a hot, really difficult race and you don't have water and you got some hills? You'll be able to say to your mind, you're going to tell yourselves, we've been here. We've done that. I can do this. So we started off, get this, at the end of an hour, none of us had stopped. And he's talking with the other people with their body. He's never seen this before. And uh, the two of us went on for two hours. And that really freaked him out because he thought it was just all physical. He didn't know that it's also spiritual. And there was a race that was coming up and he attended that race. But so too did a champion female athlete who just happened to be biking that day. And there was a, a championship race, tri-state championship race, USA track and field sponsored race. And all the top athletes were in it. I'm guessing there's around 110. And it was an out and back course. So you got to see where other people were in a race, see whether they, you were getting faster or slower. And you got to be very careful when you're a competitive athlete because people will try to trick you, meaning they'll run out really fast and everyone chases them. And suddenly you've lost your pacing. Uh, you're burning too much uh, glucose. You're going to build up lactic acid. Your legs start to hurt. Your muscles start to hurt. You can't breathe as deep and uh, start shallow breathing. And then that other person can just keep the maintain the pace and you slow down. So whatever you gain at the beginning of the race by going out too fast, you lose the end of the race by a big margin. So I always go out slow. Always. Sometimes I'm literally the last person to go out. And I'm relaxed. And I'm just breathing nice and taking it easy, no stress. And then I'm watching. So I'm going up and someone's coming back and there's a trash can. I say, okay, trash can. Check my watch. And the next time it's the trash can again. Third time, it's not the trash can. It's 10 feet before, then 20 feet, then 50 feet. Now they're getting slower. And I think, okay, we've got this amount of laps to do. We've got 10 laps to do. And they've just lost 40 seconds that they gained at the beginning. So all I have to do is maintain my pace and pick it up a bit. And I'm not going to be tired. So the psychology of racing. And so in any case, in this race, it was a boiling hot day. And I was in halfway through the race and I went into the zone. That's where all this is going. And in the zone, I got there by deep meditation, relaxing, breathing, nice and easy. And then I kept saying, liberate yourselves. Let the horses run. Let go of the reins and let them run. And then you visualize the horses running across fields, magnificent bodies, and they're not hindered. And that's what I did. Now, Dr. Ace was there, but also this friend of mine, who I had originally trained, and she won dozens, dozens of championships, national, local, state. She was there, and she said, something strange happened, Gary. 
suddenly you're way back. You have no chance in the world of even getting up in the top 20 athletes. You're about 60 places back and you just turned it on and we couldn't believe how fast the next three laps and that with one lap to go, they're starting towards the finish line. Imagine a football field and you're right at the end and you got just got to go down that track, 100 yards. And I'm on the other side. So I have to make up all that time and I did. At the end, I finished one half a second ahead of the leader, young guy, 17 years old, won the race overall. And Asik said, I don't know what I just saw. I said, it's called the zone. Okay, he had heard of the zone. He really didn't know what it was. My friend didn't know what it was. And uh, now there's a new study. And by the way, today, athletes in every field in sport will tell you, they work to get into the zone because we're in the zone, everything just clicks because there's no fear, there's no insecurity. Will I fail? Will I get a basketball and dribble off my foot and <laughs> miss a layup? You don't have any of those fears. There's a certainty of being in the moment. Now, in Queensland, Australia, the university just did a study, really remarkable study, first of its kind, where they took some of the greatest ballerinas in history, uh, Fontaine, one of the greatest, and uh, about six others, and they asked them, what made your work seem so perfect? And all of them said the same thing. They were in the zone. Hmm. Okay, explain what it meant being in the zone. I felt effortless. I felt, I felt that whatever I was doing in my movements, it was completely natural to me. And I was doing it with ease and grace and joy. It was a spiritual experience. All of them said the same thing. It was a spiritual experience. Now, sometimes we're in the zone without being conscious that we're in the zone. Think of those blissful moments you've had, the, the most intimate moments you've had with your partner. And you just felt, whoa, <laughs> this is almost un, un, unworldly. You experience something, you feel something, you're aware of something. You can't put your finger right on it, but boy, is it good. Think of the joy of doing something that you love doing. You've mastered, you do it with ease. Frequently, you're even not even conscious how good you're at that particular element because you're in the zone. Think of the love we share because in the zone, there's unconditional acceptance, unconditional love. It's a spiritual experience. It unlocks one of those doors we all have. No one's excluded from this. And, but it's allowing ourselves to overcome insecurity, uncertainty, allowing us to believe that we can do something without being, as I said originally, when everyone starts, they're all starting from insecurity and fear. And a lot of them will not show up the next week. And you say, wow, we had a thousand people here last Sunday and we got 500 this week and next week we'll have 300 and the week after we'll have 200. But if the people show up by four weeks, those will all do the marathon. Why did all the rest stop? Insecurity over the uncertainty that they would be able to disappoint themselves and other people. Hey, did you do the marathon? No. You drop out, yeah. This is going through their mind. This is all epigenetic conditioning from our childhood about something that we were not taught and given the encouragement that we could exceed some limitation. And frequently, someone else's fear becomes ours, and their insecurity becomes ours, their hate becomes ours, their biases become ours. But we can change that. But you change it at the spiritual level, which is the quantum level, because all spirit is quantum. All people have the same interconnectivity. We are all spiritual. We just don't all allow ourselves to live a spiritual life, to think through spiritual uh, consciousness. We frequently have a very highly conditioned life that is very pragmatic, very nihilistic, very angstrism. Even people who are celebrated by their success I counsel over 3,000 very famous and powerful people out of the almost 70,000 people I've counseled. And these people would, you'd think, what, why are you angry about something? Why are you sick about something? You have everything. They don't have their spiritual awareness and happiness that goes with it. Happiness is an automatic part, comes together. 
with our spiritual awareness, the joy of the divine in everything we do. Do you remember your grandparents? Do you remember any aunts or uncles? Do you remember people born during the Great Depression or before? Did you ever notice any of them had an ease of living? They lived like Fred Astaire dance with a certain grace and joy and happiness. I ask people to watch a film, Singing in the Rain. Most of us have seen it. Many have seen it dozens of times. The director of that, by the way, just passed two years ago. And what you see is you see two remarkable dancers, Gene Kelly, creative, very talented, and Donald O'Connor. Watch throughout the movie and see who you keep looking at. And I'll bet it's Donald O'Connor. Why? Because Gene Kelly is really, he's pushing it. He's doing everything he can to show you that he is, you know, he's got the rhythm. He's, he's working it. It's like an actor that overacts. They're trying to impress you with their acting. We're really good actors. You won't know they're acting. They're so believable. They're acting so natural in the role they have. Fred Astaire never had to act. He wasn't a good actor. He wasn't a great singer. But he had had that ease of movement. And he mastered that. He was in the zone when he was dancing. And you could see it. When Donald O'Connor is dancing, there's a joy, a exuberance that comes out of him. And there's an ease of which he does it. There's one scene where they're both dancing on chairs and uh, in an elocution class. And both are dancing, identical steps, but watch the fluidity of Donald O'Connor compared to Gene Kelly. Again, taking nothing away from Gene Kelly, except Donald O'Connor was in the zone. Gene Kelly wasn't. And Fred Astaire looked like he was always in the zone. There was such an ease. But he worked at it. He had to master that. Watch Begin the Beginning. It's about four and a half minutes. It's a clip from one of their movies where, in my opinion, the greatest uh, female dancer to dance with a stair, and mind you, he had a lot of partners, including, including the one that did, I think, 10 movies with him, Ginger Rogers. But again, she was hoofing it. Nothing looked fluid and e at ease. And a lot of others, and some were more classical, uh, like... Um, well, he had three classical dancers who danced classically and danced with him. But again, it, they didn't look natural. They didn't look fluid. They didn't look like they were having a good time. They were trying to perform for you and really working it. Uh, but there's a movie that was done. And one scene in it is called The Beginning of the Beginning, Eleanor Powell. And you watch Eleanor Powell and you watch Fred Astaire. They are just absolutely perfect in rhythm. Her smile, it's so exuberant. She's having fun. And the moves they did were perfection. Then years later, uh, she was married to the actor Glenn Ford. Years later, she was being interviewed in the 1950s. And she said that one four-minute dance scene, and by the way, Fred Astaire made sure that his cinematographer never cut. Today, you do one scene for two seconds, cut. And then you do it over again 20 times till you get the right one. Fred Astaire did every single thing in one take. And if it missed it, you do it all over again from scratch. No cutting, no editing. In any case, she said that just the hand movements, the choreography of her hands took two weeks. And in Hollywood, two weeks meant you work six days a week, 12 hours a day, just to get the hand movement right choreography. Imagine how long it took to master all the steps. But it's one of the most joyful film clips to ever watch. Go up and Google, begin the begin, Fred Astaire, Eleanor Powell. And she just had this effervescent personality. It was just contagious. You couldn't help watch her without smiling and thinking, wow, she's in the zone. She was. So what does all this lead us to? We can either stay learning, linear, one step, two step, one, two, three, four, five, or we can learn in a quantitative way. 
one a hundred. Which means that we have to do our deep meditations, go in and have that conversation with our inner voice and liberate that voice, open that door. And suddenly the whole spirit energy, what the Orientals call chi, comes and when you're getting acupuncture, what's it doing? It's liberating the chi, acupressure. Put your thumb on a place, acupuncture point of meridian, and it liberates the energy, the chi. And we have hundreds of scientific studies proving that, that works, acupuncture works. But we also have life studies that shows that being a happy person is not based upon what you own or what your goals are in achieving a goal. Because then you lose balance in the process of attaining goals. Think how many people right now, they're successful. They're financially okay. They're well-respected in their careers. But in, in order to master their career, they had to stop mastering their life. When they stopped mastering their life, that meant quality time for the kids. Where's mom? She's working late. Where's dad? No, he's working hard, but when dad says, hey, look, what am I doing all this for? Why am I working 16 hours a day as a surgeon? So you can have everything that I didn't have as a kid, and therefore you'll find happiness and pleasure. The kid's thinking, I, I don't need all that, dad. I just like to, for us to be able to go out and go camping or go bowling or, you know, go out and throw baseball together. You never have time. When was the last time we had a dinner together? When was the last time we had a dinner together and everyone wasn't complaining or aching or about something and watching their cell phones? You, the success of one part of life concomitantly reduces the joy and happiness and balance of another part of your life. I've never met a successful person that could say they were happy that I've counseled. Now, I need to say I've only counseled about 3,000 People were very famous and Academy Award winners and and uh, people were high, visible, successful people. You don't see them as I see them. I see them vulnerable. When they sit across from me, they don't sit with their agent, their manager, their lawyer, their retinue of uh, gophers. People go get this and that for them. Their personal assistants, their nannies, their uh, therapists, their stylists, their makeup artists, their cosmetic surgeons. No, it's just that person and myself. And then we begin our journey. And I see them just as a human being with all that should make them happy that they want to possess. And they possess it all. They're not happy. They walk around with this hidden angst, what I call the big empty. Their life seems filled, but there's an emptiness within them. They try to disguise it, but it comes out frequently. I would rather not have the success and be happy because I'm living in balance. Because almost everything we do once we become successful is stop focusing upon the inner journey, the spiritual journey, the journey of awareness, of consciousness. We start focusing upon, well, they have that, we got to get it. Well, that costs a lot of money. Well, then we'll go into debt on it. And I just have to work harder. Well, my generation of baby boomers, we didn't learn any lessons about life. We only learn lessons about hard work and success. They're not the same. Think about the zone. There's lots of work out there on the zone. It's a reality. It's not a myth. It's not something hocus pocus. It's not something esoteric. And when you are able to tap into the zone, watch what happens to you. Oh, and by the way, one last thing. And the USA National 40K Championship with about, I think, around somewhere around 136 athletes. And everyone was the champion, the champion of Los Angeles, champion of San Francisco, champion of New Orleans, New York. All these people come together. And, uh, but there's only one winner. And I was seeded, based upon my best previous time, 65th. My buddy was seeded 66, or 66 and 67th. And so we had trained together. And so at the end of the first 10K, it was a hot day. And it was really kind of gross because the people were running in front of us were so sweaty. Sheets of sweat were hitting us. And my buddy said, man, this is gross. And, uh, you know, he tried, kept wiping off his face from the sweat. And at the 10 mile mark, I said, Franco, I'm going into the zone now. 
He said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I said, I'm going into the zone because you're complaining about how hot it is, how steep the hills are, how tight the muscles are, how much pain you have in your calves, how tough it is to breathe with all this humidity, it just rained, it's about 100 degrees. I said, "Where? what message are you giving yourselves? I don't know. I said, no. And he's a great athlete, by the way. And I said, I'm going into the zone. He didn't know what I was talking about. He thought I was stopping. I didn't. I started to kick, meaning I went, picked up my pace. Now, from that moment to the end, I was completely in the zone. I didn't hear anything. I didn't. I didn't even know how I stood on the course. I was just focused. I remember as around the 22nd mile, the whole row was blocked with runners, the elitist, the best, the ones that choose the national team in the Olympians. I remember I came up to him and I had to run off the uh, street over the curb and back down again because they had the whole road block. I remember hearing someone say, didn't we pass him? Yeah, we passed. Didn't we? Didn't we pass him? And they didn't know. And no, they hadn't. And so all I felt was at the end, Elliot Dimon, the uh, race director, said, and the winner's Gary all." I was over 40 years of age and set a new American record. And uh, not a single person came over to ask, how did you do that? How'd you go from way back there to being the first American coming across the line in that race? Had they asked, I would have said it's about the zone where I chose to put my mind and consciousness and my body followed. It liberates, the zone liberates yourselves, creating, you're liberated, working out, you're liberated, dealing with people, you're liberated, thinking, you're liberated. It helps everything in life. I'll do more on this on an upcoming topic, and uh, but I just want to share that, see if it makes sense to you. If something I share doesn't make sense, then don't use it. If it does or stimulates your interest, then go further, and you'll see there's a lot of writings, a lot of videos on this. Dr. Bruce Lipton has a lot to say on this. Dr. Bruce Lipton, look up his work. It's wonderful. And of course, other people around the world are saying, oh, you're just finding something we've been using for the last 3,000 years in our culture? Yeah, we're a little slow to catch up. But when we do, we learn our lessons. You can also hear my show broadcast daily on prn.live, progressive radio network.live, prn.live. And you can hear all the other wonderful voices we have on there. It's like over the weekends, Abby Martin, terrific, terrific uh, journalist, uh, and Ralph Nader. Uh, we have so many good people. And you can go to my website, garyandall.com, and download an awful lot of good information that can help you. So thank you for taking your time now, and I look forward to our next Classroom on the Air. Are you tired of closed-minded programming? Well, look no further than PRN.Live, the home for progressive voices.